Well, there's something really special about a winter carp, especially from a low stock pit. The challenge always seems huge. You're up against it from the day dot, it's freezing cold. And I guess sometimes for me, I liken it to maybe fortune favors the brave. You know, the banks are quiet, not many anglers not, might not necessarily want to pit their wits against a, a low stock venue in the depths of winter. But this winter was really different. And if there was ever a winter to capitalize on a warmer climate, it was now. It didn't feel quite as cold as it has been in prior years. And I thought this winter, for a change, especially for me, I thought I'd dust the rods off and give it a go. Well, there's no denying that banks are normally a lot quieter than the summer. But that lovely visual that I have in my head of winter fishing means that the leaves are falling on the trees, you get the lovely rustic browns, the crimsons of all the leaves that are floating on the surface. That to me is the visual that I crave to be out of the house and in the elements for winter fishing. The banks are quieter, like I say, and quite often the water is warmer than the atmosphere and you get that lovely steam evaporating off in the morning. And it's just everything you want from a, from a carp angler's dawn. Well, everything I described about winter carp fishing there, the campaign I was just about to embark on was the complete polar opposite. And I was about to find out exactly just how different this campaign would be from the usual quintessential English carp lake with the quiet banks. Nothing could be further from the truth. Usually I hang my rods up and catch up on all the house chores. I've got a young son, family and all the things that demand my time when uh, at times I can be a bit obsessive during the autumn and the spring. You know, as carp anglers, it can be a bit selfish. You get your tunnel vision and all the other things around you get put to one side. So uh, those rods usually stay in the kitchen. The baits are usually dry, hanging off the rings until I get the first rays of spring and I'm back out again. But um, this was different. I knew this campaign, specifically this particular water, had a bit of winter form. The weather was good. It hadn't had that big, long, cold snap that we usually get. But I still knew that if I was to succeed, it would require dedication, sacrifice, and some really hard graft. And uh, anything in carp fishing doesn't come without those things ticking all the boxes. So I was up against it but I knew it was now or never, and I really wanted to give this six week window, because that's all I had, all my efforts. And I was riding on the back of a previous campaign that had finished a little bit early in October last year. And uh, I was full of confidence. I had tactics that I knew I was gonna deploy in this campaign, and I couldn't wait to get the rods out. I think the most important thing is you have to be motivated. You have to be motivated to wanna get out there, regardless of the elements, regardless of the weathers, because let's face it, I wasn't seeing much. You're probably not gonna see much in the winter. It's a harsh reality that you're usually stood in the teeth of a gale, your wind burnt. In fact, I'm still suffering now with sort of cracked lips and chapped skin. But um, yeah, you have to be self-motivated. And I've always found that quite easy. And in fact, I love being thrown in at the deep end and this winter is no different. And that alone is motivating enough for me to drive on and give it all my effort in the hope of just holding one cold winter carp. Well, I guess it's really important to give you a bit of an insight of where I am today. I mean, it looks vastly different today to when I was here only a couple of weeks ago. The spring sun shines out, but only two weeks ago it felt Baltic and I was wrapped up with all my winter layers. But we are right in the heart of a really busy city. Now, this particular place is over 200 years old and it's a concrete oasis. I've never fished a lake that old and it was dug way, way back in 1822 and this year it's celebrating its 200th anniversary. It wasn't till the early 1930s that this place was turned into a bit of an oasis for public. It was boating, angling, sunbathing, swimming, you name it everything was going on here and to think of a, a lake steeped in history like this with a few really old carp in just added fuel to my fire to really want in one of these carp in the album now in terms of fish stocks well that was a that was a challenge in itself the general consensus 25 to maybe 30 carp in 60 odd acres in terms of winter trying to find those fish wow it was a tall order but that again just made me want to give it my all you know to catch one of only 25 or 30 carp in in such a vast expanse of water that looked bleak and cold you know that was the drive and the motivation i needed to get me out the house in the morning and give it my best shot well if you haven't guessed already we are smack bang in the middle of a big public park now park lake carp fishing is completely different I just love the fact that there's hundreds of people walking up and down this lake that have no idea that the carp are even residing in this lake. And what's even more 
fascinating for me is that you know we like to think that in carp fishing everything's documented and quite often at a syndicate you can kind of trace these carp back with documented pictures from many many years ago or if there's new fish going in they're quite often documented too but in park lakes i really didn't know what i was potentially going to catch i had an idea from the locals what might be in here but who knows i could have caught a record goldfish that somebody had slipped in a couple of years ago it really is like that as you'll see through this film, the public were astonished when we actually caught one. So the sort of carp fishing that I love to do, I know that it's usually short spurts of intense fishing, but I put a lot of emphasis into the preparation and not only is it the walking, trickling a bit of baiting, trying to be here as often as I can, usually for me means getting up an hour or two before work, driving, hundreds, sometimes thousands of miles during a short space of time, just to try and keep in touch with the lake. But also the prep for me is trying to have everything aligned at home. You know, I know I speak to my friends and say, I'm probably just gonna be focused on the campaign for the next three or four weeks. You know, I'm not gonna be coming out for that beer or I'm not gonna be doing anything in the house. The DIY is gonna to have to be parked. So that's a part of the prep for me also. But leading into this, everything for me is about trying to get as close to getting a sight in or just seeing something that's going to give me that little window of opportunity to capitalise on and you can't do that when you're at home so it means being here as often as I can and that's exactly what I did. I was driving here up the motorway, off the motorway, almost every morning before work and then taking a detour back into work. I mean it made every single day about 14 hours long, it's exhausting but uh, at the same time, really rewarding because I felt that I was keeping in tune with not only the weather, but also the lake, the anglers, and it just opened up a little wind of opportunity that I didn't expect to have so soon. Well, up until this point, I hadn't seen a fish. I hadn't seen a single show. It was bleak. And, uh, but I needed to at least get the rods out and try and get in tune with it and just sort of embrace it really. I needed to get some bait in the water and that's exactly what I did prior to getting the rods out. Now, the first session for me is always a bit rusty. I don't know about yourselves, but you, you, know, you try and get in tune with the lake and I found quite quickly that I needed to change my bank sticks. It was a concrete slope. And in fact, I actually needed to change my buzzers because my Steve Neville buzzers, because the rods were on a tilt, meant that the wheels were jammed in the rods. So even if I got a pipe, it wouldn't register. So there's a few things I needed to change, but I, I love just embracing the first session. And in fact, when I get in the car on the way home, you kind of mull over in your mind, you know, what you're gonna do next. Was there any clues that might just give the game away? Well, I'm looking out a vast expanse of very cold water today uh, and anyone that can start a campaign in January, especially on a sparsely stocked lake, might be able to relate to what I'm going to try and describe. It feels like a bite is a million miles away uh, and today I've seen nothing. But I'm really excited because this, this is the first session, I hope of many, where I'm going to try and get a bite before the end of March. Now. Uh, I kind of liken these sort of starts to campaigns to maybe a, uh, a rock climber or a, a, a guy who's trying to climb Everest. You know, the summit is the peak and that's the pinnacle of anyone who's trying to climb a mountain. At the moment, for me, a pinnacle or a summit is just to try and get a bite. At the moment, I definitely feel I'm on base camp. I don't know my way up the mountain, but it's really exciting times because this is what I really love about a campaign is trying to work out and unlock something that will lead eventually to me holding a cold water carp. So the sun is shining. This is the first day. Who knows where it's going to take me, but I can't wait. And there was something that happened in that first session that I genuinely believed paved the way for the rest of the campaign. And in winter, you know, you often hear the term, uh, sometimes something small is everything. And I had nothing to go on in terms of shows, but the wind was hacking down the lake continuously. And in fact, it was, you know, it was a harsh reality that I'm up against it here. But there was one part of the lake that was kind of off the wind. Now there's 150 swans on this lake and they were being pulled down to the pit on a big southerly by the strength of the wind. But if they just moved into the lull of this island, they sort of sat there, it was almost like a mill pond, and they didn't get moved around by the undertow or the, or the ferocity of the wind. And it just looked like the ideal spot. You know, if I was a carp, where would I want to be? And it would be off the wind. So I decided before I left, just to lead around that area, and I found a, a, a a spot between some really rancid 200 year old silt that was really clean. It was off the wind, the swans were sort of milling around there and it just felt totally different. It just felt warmer in that part of the lake. 
and that was to be my next line of attack. So I left that evening, putting a bit more bait out, vowing to return in three or four days time. Well, I booked, strategically booked some days off work between the first session leading up to the end of the season and the second session, everything felt a little bit easier. I was more in tune with the lake, the rods went out sweet, you know, I had them already clipped up to the, to the new spots that I'd found. And prior to that, I'd already put a little bit more bait in on consecutive days leading up to this second session. You know, sitting back, knowing I'd done everything I possibly can in the hope that just uh, I might just have one single opportunity felt really good. I sat back that morning to embrace the craziness of the, uh, of the park with the public walking past. But what was about to unravel was beyond my wildest dreams. I remember that morning feeling really confident. It was bitterly cold still, um, but I just sat back on the chair, Rod sat back and I was just about to make my first cup of tea of the day and the tip just bounced round, almost like a bream bite. And uh, the tip bounced again and I thought, I'll just lift into it. And I lifted into this carp, which came in almost in a subdued manner until it got under the tip and its big tail come out of the water and flapped on the surface. And only then I realised, crikey, this is my first bite. And it wasn't much of a fight before I put the net under an incredible mahogany, long, perfectly conditioned 35 pound part lake common. Well, with the fish in the net, I'm more than aware from experience that there's usually small little feeding windows in the winter. So I quickly changed the hook on the rig and got the rod straight back out. You know, one might be luck, but if I was to get another opportunity, maybe I've found their winter holding area. So the rods were firmly back on the rest and I had to sort this fish out. So I gave my friend Mark and Jack a call because, you know, looking at these concrete banks, I was definitely going to need a hand, especially with the public. And it was a short while later where they came down to give me a hand to weigh and photograph this incredible carp. Well, I sat back with a massive grin on my face. You know, like I've described at the start, I just wanted one fish from this particular campaign and to catch it on my second morning, I was absolutely gobsmacked. But having that rig back out on the spot, I wasn't expecting what was about to unfold. And no sooner had the kettle boiled on that cobbled damn wall, which uh, I must add is uh, incredibly difficult to fish. I was only turning over my ankles, things were going everywhere. Often you put the kettle down, it falls over. But um, yeah, I sat there and the rod hooped around again, the recast, rod and I was into another part lake carp. It was at this point, I don't know who was more surprised, me or Mark, but Mark grabbed the camera as I carefully guided a, a lovely dark mahogany mirror that went up and down the deep margins of the dam wall eventually into the net. So at this point I've got one in the net, one in the sling and I've doubled my quota for what I really set out to achieve and uh, well, I, I was just lost for words. You know, what a morning. To get two in quick succession was just incredible. And just reliving it now brings back all those emotions of that day. And uh, yeah, it was an extra special morning for sure. Yeah. Go on in. Right, got it? Yeah. Sure? Yeah, got it. Ooh. Well, what a surprise. This carp has blown me away today. Tiny little pecs, little weathered fins, tail, and uh, for a concrete carp, that is about as good as it gets. Look at its dorsal. Well, lack of. I have no idea how old these carp are or the history of them, but wow, that has made me really happy. <laughs> well, it's an old fish, really old fish. I'm not too sure whether he'll let me have one last look before we go back. But that is freezing cold water and the carp isn't much better. But there we are. That is absolutely beautiful. Well, slipping that first one back, it was a gentle reminder of just how cold it still was. And I guess there's nothing more symbolic for me uh, of a winter capture than trying to warm your hands up over a, over a warm stove to just to get some life back into them because I had another carp to hold up for the camera. Oh, I've got to have a little, a little break between lifting the second fish because my hands are so cold. They've gone kind of blue and uh, it's been a long time since I had a carp and that fish is freezing cold. So 
just need to recharge, get these hands warm, and then uh, get the bigger one out. Oh, what a morning. Well, this is where things got really interesting. I was just trying to photograph the second fish. You know, the cameraman and Mark were, we were trying to keep the public away. And uh, before I knew it, I heard a shout from Mark and I thought somebody was actually stealing some tackle, which is a possibility at a public park. But as I looked down with the fish in my arms, Mark's holding onto a rod that's being wrenched out of his hands by clearly what is another big fish. So I've safely secured the fish. Jack, the cameraman, has put the fish back into the water in the sling and I've jumped down the wall to do battle with another big Park Lake car. Oh, wow, a bit out of breath. I uh, talk about a February window of opportunity. We were just getting the, uh, the second fish out, the bigger one of the two, and Mark's given me a little shout and the rod is hooped around and we're into a third fish of the day. Wow, that is, that's unbelievable. I, uh, I knew the weather had broken, it looked prime for a bite, but this has completely surprised me. I was hoping for one fish between now and when this place closed in March and to get three bites in an hour or so. Yeah, this is, uh, this has really surprised me. When I came to the park, there was an element of mystery for me, not really knowing what was still left which was great and I love that part of this campaign. You know, if I was fortunate to get a bite, it would be a complete surprise. But these fish, from what I could gather, were over 40 years old, probably, probably older than me, and that just, for, just needed to be commended. They deserve the most utmost respect. That's a big fish. That is a big fish. But one fish in particular that I knew had been out about four years prior was a big, thick set steely common and it was a local guy called Clive and I did have a picture of that and it was mainly the reason why I thought I just wonder I just wonder if that fish is still surviving and I remember turning to Mark and him saying to me that looks very big very wide and very steely grey if he was ever going to say something to sort of make my knees knock and get me a little bit nervous of what I was attached to it was now but he was right and as it was wallowing and coming to the net it was getting bigger and bigger and this thing looked absolutely huge, just wired across the back like a Labrador and I think it was Mark that did the honours and engulfed it into the net. Go on my boy, we got him, yes, yes, me. yes, yes. And I just sort of slumped there with my hands on my head thinking that is, has to be has to be the carp that I had in mind and one of the reasons why I'm here and uh, yeah I was about to find out. <laughs> Certainly looks like one of the biggest fish in this, in this concrete park and I've run out of sacks in February. That just doesn't seem right. As I looked round the public had amassed behind me, it had, I'd gathered a bit of a crowd and uh, at this point I've got a very large fish in the net, something that they'd probably never seen. There was like gasping and wows, can you eat it? Can you take it home? All the usual stuff you get from the public at the park. But there's me with a big grin, a huge common in the net and this mirror that we had to gently lower back in the margins to sort out in complete disarray. The swim was carnage, but first things first, we had to get this big common out just to see how big this particular common was and I was about to be blown away. Oh wow, wow, you're not going to believe that, 49, 49, Hello, I can't see it. Jack, 49, it's open, isn't it? just I'll settle for 49. <laughs> 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 With the big one now safely secured in the sack and in the deep margins to have a rest, it was time to get that lovely dark chestnut mirror out, more typical of the strain of mirrors that I remember this park being famous for. And uh, yeah, it was a hoist up onto the dam wall, Mark took the strain and I carefully carried it to the map where I just lifted it up to admire my prize. He's, uh, he's been through a few battles this one. Who knows what's happened here? Possibly otter? I don't know. But they're so unique. I have no idea about the history, but I know they're old. Look at that. Oh, time to go. Right. 
while slipping that mirror back into the freezing, inky, ice cold Park Lake water, it looks huge. And at £39.14, ounces, it was a big cold water carp. <sighs> yes. Oh, that's cold. But I needed a bit more strength because the last fish that was resting there that needed its picture taken and I wanted to admire was a bit bigger, a whole lot bigger, in fact, but it was time to get it out. When I first started, I had no idea what Everest looked like, but you could say this for me is it. <sighs> that is a big carp. <sighs> oh. I've known from experience that fishing in the winter can be all or nothing. Initially, I thought the first bite may have been luck, but obviously subsequently catching those two incredible carp, I knew that I'd found them. Oh, yes. In winter is typical of a carp's behaviour. They're very localised. When you find one, you usually find them all. Usually they're tucked into the side of a weed bed off a big wind. And what was really, really evident is the fish were covered in leeches. So those fish have probably overwintered in this area. Had I got lucky? I didn't see anything. Was it watercraft? Possibly. Was it uh, an element of just hard graft and, and, and maybe putting a bait where the wind had cut through and give it a bit of a lull? I think so, but either either or, I'd found them and I knew that they wouldn't be going far. If I could keep the bait trickling in, there was a good opportunity that maybe I could catch a few more. But I'd found their winter home and it was time to, uh, to give it another go. I guess one thing I haven't mentioned is this particular venue is days only as well, so it's dawn till dusk. So I only had a short period of time to capitalise on uh, potentially getting a bite. Now, it's something I've always done. I've always used a rig that I can quickly change the hook. So I think particularly that day, getting that rod back out very quickly by quickly changing the hook, putting a new bait on and getting it back out on the spot was the catalyst to three really quick bites. And that little short feeding window was capitalised on because after that, it went very, very quiet and probably rightly so. Now, the rig in particular is something that um, a few of my friends chuckle because I'd had a really good campaign last year and the rig I use has a boom section of tungsten loaded semi-stiff. It has a loop at both ends, loop onto the swivel where the lead clip sits and a loop at the other end so I can change the hook. Now what's quite ironic is that I'd caught all my fish last year on that exact rig. Now the, the coating hadn't broken, it was still extremely strong, which I tested. And all I've been doing all last year was changing the hook. And the rigs were still on the rods before I started this campaign. So I started this campaign with exactly the same rig. All I did was change the hook. Now, a few of my friends laugh at me, but I'm a bit of a stickler for consistency. And that's the same length rig doing exactly the same thing that it should do. And I don't like to change anything, but I think it's about time that I give it a change now, just to be on the safe side. Well, the prep part of a campaign is everything for me. And to be honest, I liken that more than the actual end result. I always think of a start of a campaign as throwing all the jigsaw pieces onto a table. And every session you might get an opportunity to put one more piece in the puzzle and bring the bigger picture together. So the prep is everything. I love the pre-baiting. I love all the planning that gets done at home, the weather the morning walks, and as you start to put those pieces together, you kind of work towards the, a result somewhat. And, uh, you know, it's part and parcel of these campaigns is embracing the blanks. I always think of a blank as just one step closer to a result. So it's, uh, for me, the prep is the most enjoyable part, I guess for a cliche word, the journey. And I think that's the most important part and the bit I enjoy the most. I guess what was evident after those first two days 
was the public. Now, I've been talking about the public throughout this campaign, and I don't for one minute want you to feel that it's a negative because I quickly realised that embracing the public was going to be a key element to, uh, to having any longevity over the next three or four weeks. I got used to the regular dog walkers, the runners in the morning, the people that would walk around. Everyone had a story to tell and uh, add to the fact that I was probably fishing the busiest swim or area on this particular lake. Life stories, history, there was even a lovely shop on site where every now and again I'd get some cones of chips to sit on the wall and embrace the day. But there was never a dull moment and uh, in a strange way it really helped pass the day. And uh, once you got to know them, first name terms, they got to know me, I really started to sort of slot into uh, public life at the park and I really enjoyed it. Well getting home that evening it would have been really easy for me to uh, dust myself off put some more tea bags in the bag and come back the next day and try and step and repeat what had just happened. But experience has always told me that I'd already disturbed the group of fish. If they had been over a wintering in that area, experience tells me the worst thing you can do is try and catch as many as you can in a short space of time. I found the longevity of the pre-baiting and your results are really affected. So I came away knowing I had at least another week of regular baiting every day before work. And then the plan was to drop on there for another day in about seven days time. So when I say pre-baiting, I'm talking 50 baits every morning or every evening. Sometimes I'd do it with my son if we were free on a weekend. Other times I'd do it before work. But the key was to give them a bit of free food, to build that confidence up and don't disturb them. Because hopefully, when I come back for that next session, confidence was already high, I knew, fingers crossed, there was a chance for another bite. Well, the next session came around pretty quickly. And as I wheeled my barrow up through the concrete pavement, I looked down to where I'd been fishing and it was free. And the sun was just peeking over the, uh, the city centre. And I just knew that if I get the rod out quickly, there was a chance. And what happened was exactly a repeat of the previous week. And within an hour, the rods hooped round again and I was doing battle, this time with a huge, long, mahogany serpent of a common. I remember that day, the waves lapping into the concrete wall and I'm trying to net this fish, which is almost struggling to fit into the net, but it kind of folded in, engulfed in the net with the spray of the freezing cold wind hitting me, looking down thinking, that is another huge, huge carp. The best thing about carp fishing is it's so personal and for me it's always been about own terms angling. I know what potentially I really enjoy might be completely different to another angler and I didn't come to this park purposely to catch big carp. You know, if I just wanted one cold winter bite, regardless of size, I'd have been happy. But this was the fourth bite and when I look back at the weights, for those four fish combined, the average weight was 41 and a half pounds. I mean, Sometimes in angling, you know, you get on a run, you, you, you have real purple patches. And I have to say, I sit here now just thinking about that day, thinking that run of fish, I don't know if I'll ever sort of beat this run of fish I've had in the last 12 months. It's just been, you know, biblical. And uh, yeah, the best bits of carp fishing all rolled into one. While slipping that 43 pound common back, I realised I was already on borrowed time. I had three weeks of the season left to go, so it was fast approaching the end of February. I did catch a few more fish, but I guess they're a story for another time. And when I reflect back, this is probably my last trip here talking to camera. I'll probably never come back to the park again, and it's been a campaign compressed into a short space of time beyond my wildest dreams. I'd planned to maybe get a feel for it in February and maybe come back when the season back opened in June, but that's not to be. I got very, very lucky, and as the sun's shining now, spring is in the air, and if there's ever a time to get the rods out, it's now. Carp are up and about, and there's plenty of carp to be caught. So if you're out on the bank, be lucky. <laughs>